Hello, welcome to the Arts and Traveller podcast, episode number four. And I'm here today in the suburbs of London in South Woodford with a gemologist, a photographer, and an author by the name of Kim Ricks. Hello, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, hello. And just something that was interesting as we were talking just now is um, the market for fake gemstones. And you've got a story about a a suspected ruby that you bought. Mm -hmm. What's the story behind that? Yes, well, really, um, this this is the ruby that that I wish I hadn't bought, that I regret buying. Although, on the other hand, I actually don't regret buying because it really was the inspiration behind the book series that I've written. And basically, I grew up uh, being very passionate about gemstones, and um, I was a bit addicted. Uh, I was a bit of a, a, a gem addict or jewellery addict, and every holiday that I used to go on, I used to go and have a look um in the area the local area to see what you know the cultural souvenirs were were uh, and to see what gemstones and jewelry had been sort of unearthed and what jewelry they'd made you know the local women so um so i went on holiday about 5 years ago i was in in egypt in sharm el sheikh uh, which is um a very well known tourist destination but little did I know that Egypt is actually quite a notorious destination for fake gemstones on the market. Wow, really? Anyway, I, I'm i not really the kind of person to sit still. I often go off with my camera whilst my husband is by the pool, chilling out. And on this occasion, we'd have gone to Egypt to see the pyramids. And in Sharm El Sheikh, as I say, it's a tourist destination, so there wasn't really anything else for me to go and photograph. So I wandered into the jewellery boutique, which was attached to the four-star hotel that we were staying in. And I, and I went in there and I introduced myself to, to the gentleman who was running the boutique. And then really every day, every day of that holiday, I, I'd go in there and I'd chat with him. Um, you know, and sort of share a little bit of gem knowledge or show off my gem knowledge. And Were you quite new to the, the gemology scene at this point? Well, at this point, I, ha- I wasn't a gemologist. At this point, I had no idea, complete really. Complete novice. I was a complete novice. Only, I only knew what I, what I knew from the TV, reading a few books. Um, really, that, that was it, talking to people. That was my, my knowledge, really. And as I say, I thought I knew. I thought I knew a lot. So the idea that something could be fake... Um, didn't even cross my mind. So when I actually went into this boutique and I and I saw this gemstone, uh, and I fell in love with it, and I got really friendly with the with the guy. And by the end of the week, I thought he was my friend. I thought, you know, I, I didn't didn't possibly conceive that he could tell me that something was a natural Burmese ruby, and sell me something that when I got back to London and I showed it to a friend. And he looked at it and said, mm, it's probably glass, might be synthetic, but it's definitely not natural and it's not real. Wow. Well, I can tell you the embarrassment that I felt, you know, being, well, I think the it was a mixture of emotions, being disappointed, a little bit annoyed with myself for having been allowed myself to be suckered. I mean, how naive was I did to you, think? Did you pay quite a lot for the, the stone? No. And that's really, that's one of the keys that I tell people now, that if you actually do come across a gemstone that's flawless, or it's beautiful clarity and absolutely flawless, and it's going really cheap, then alarm bells should start to ring. If it looks too good to be it, true, it absolutely. probably is. Absolutely, yeah. that's the same, yes. Yeah. So, so yeah, so that's my story. So I came home back from Egypt with, with a synthetic gemstone, a synthetic ruby. And that, and as I say, the disappointment and the emotions that I went through actually made me want to go and study properly. So I, I went for GIA um, and I actually attended what was full time, seven months in a classroom, uh, studying, uh, learning how to identify natural versus fake or uh, synthetic gemstones. Um, and then so seven months later I qualified and I was at a bit of a turning point then because being a nat- uh, being a professional photographer that was my full-time job before I actually went to the GIA and trying to get back into the flow trying to get the momentum back just doing photography was really hard 
And also I really kind of wanted to then put my new knowledge from being a gemologist to good use. And really, and it can, and then my experience of having been cheated was really what inspired me. The, it gave me the idea to to write these books that would actually help to protect people from fraud when they're abroad buying gemstones and jewelry. So that, that's exactly what I, I've I've gone ahead and done. So I've actually been to these countries. I've been sort of selecting my countries, which are tourist destinations. So I started off with Sri Lanka. And then I went to Thailand, and then I went to Australia, then I went to India. And I spent, and each country was two to three, I spent two to three visits in each country. Uh, some of some of the visits were six weeks, some of them were two weeks. And I just combined all that knowledge and information that I discovered from talking to other tourists, from talking to locals, from going into museums, from going into the gemstone and jewellery shops in that location, and just gathering all the information, um, including some of the knowledge that you don't get to find on the internet, um, you know, sort of the rules of negotiation, the rules of the trade in that country. I mean, it's been very interesting. So you're literally doing, like, doing it by practising out when you're there? You're not Absolutely. Saying... I put myself into the shoes of a tourist... And and I and I go and find out what it's like to actually buy gemstones and jewellery in that country. And every country, the gem trade in every country is completely different. It's different culture, different rules, different legislation, different laws when it comes to what you can bring home as a souvenir and what you can't. Different rules for uh, buying duty free and claiming tax back. So all these things, all this information, the what to look for, what to avoid, what the, what are the important questions to ask, all that information has gone into the books. And you can uh, find the books. I will actually leave a description. Uh, sorry, I'll leave a link in the description box uh, for the YouTube listeners uh, to Kim's book series. Um, so you can go to these countries and obviously... Uh, buy gemstones uh, without the fear of, of getting stung, as it, was, yes. uh, as it may be. Um, so how did you get into photography? What was, because you said that was your first um, sort of vocation as opposed to the gemstones. How did you get into photography? Actually, photography was, um, I got into photography through my first business as an entrepreneur, which in fact was event management, where I was actually organising social events um, for executives and through doing that, I actually uh, I, I learned how to f capture events. I learned how to predict what what were the likely what was likely to happen next. I learned to capture people in celebration mode. So I I I was doing portrait photography. I was doing event photography. I was doing wedding photography, and I and and I suppose so. You could say I'm self-taught in the same way that I'm I was you know, tried to self-teach myself about gemstones, I was self-taught with, with, the, with the photography. It's so unbelievable, isn't it, how, like, with uh, with blogging, I've just started writing a few words on a page and now it's escalated to the point where, you know, I get to work with, with companies and get to travel, you know, on the on behalf of tourist boards and things like that. It's, it's amazing what you can actually do mm. just through dipping your toe in the water. Well, it's about combining your I mean I combined my passions it's about having your passion and following your passion and really my passions are the photography the gemstones uh, and and I really kind of you know I love traveling and I wanted to see more of the world and I couldn't think of a better way really the idea of coming up with the books was gave me all those three gave me a means to actually follow all three of my passions which I now live every day that's incredible. Uh, it's inspiring as well to other people because I'm sure, like me, you you help other people along the way. You know, people who are asking, you know, how to, you know, get into the whole gemstone uh, or the the business, I suppose, of of gemstones and the identification process and things that uh, surround that subject. I mean, is it? Um, would you say travels inspired a lot of your discoveries in uh, in terms of gemstones? Um, well, I have to say that probably I was inspired by my grandparents who were avid travellers uh -huh. and they used to go around the, the world sort of travelling and, and 
every now and again, my grandmother, she bought me back a, a, an, an amethyst from Madagascar and then a moonstone from India. And my mother as well. She, My parents are divorced and my mother went to teach in Colombia. So every now and again, she'd send me back a little piece of jewellery with a little with a little emerald in. So I've grown up with, with family that are constant constantly travelling and um, it was very hard for me really to sit and watch and look at their photos and, and not do some of it myself. So the moment that, you know, so I think really that's where my love for travelling and gemstones has really come from. It's just really sort of, you know, the family, the family sort of being sort of passionate about travelling and, and seeing the world as well. It's really interesting because I, I come from a family that haven't really travelled. I'm one of a kind really in terms of actually sort of going to travel, uh, beginning with Europe and then, you know, branching out. You eventually sort of get a taste for it. You go yeah. to the next place, the next place, the next place. Well, it's difficult because my family are all over the world, really. I'm very lucky. I've got I've got a brother in Australia. I've got another brother in America. I've got extended family in the Philippines and Sweden, extended family in Germany, um, you know, so, and I've made sort of, and I've got um, another sort of extended honorary family who live in Atlanta, and it, it's, you know, and I, I'm, I suppose I'm blessed to have these, you know, friends and family all over the world that I can actually go and visit, and then I can indulge in my passion you know, with you know, go and f- go and see what they what, what in the local area, what they've got in the way of gemstones and jewellery. Do you have so. a favourite place to go back to? Um, gosh, I get this is probably the most frequent question that I'm asked, and it and it doesn't get any easier to answer. And there is, and I and I think I mean I have fallen in love with so many countries. I mean, I've fallen in love with Sri Lanka, but that's partly because I love Sri Lankan curries. But also the the landscape in Sri Lanka, it's so beautiful and unspoilt. I love I love Australia. I spent six months going around the outback. Um, I drove four and a half thousand kilometres to do my research for the for the Australian book, and I absolutely loved digging for sapphires and I loved fossicking for opals, and the people were so friendly. Um, so, uh, you know, part of me, my heart is in Australia, um, as well as I had the opportunity to go and see my brother and my, my little nephews when I was in Australia. So, I mean, I'm in love with Australia, but I love Thailand as well, you know, but again, I love the, the Thai curries and the countryside is beautiful up in the north. uh, And it's just so, so interesting. I mean, the people are interesting and friendly. Um, I don't know. So there is so, I'm having difficulty deciding where I'm going to retire, basically, (laughs) Um, but yeah, I, there are so many places that I've fallen in love with, so I'm not sure I do have a favourite, really. I only asked that question because I got asked on a, a radio interview uh, a couple of days ago for Radio Leicester. They just hit me with it straight away. What's your favourite place? Because, you know, travel blogging and all the rest of it. Yes. And I couldn't decide. I had to literally think on the spot and I just plucked a name out of the air and I think Paris just about gets it. Oh, uh, really? But it's quite divisive because a lot of people don't like Paris as much like they see it as sort of busy tourist traffic dirty yeah. but for me like I, I went to work in France when I was 17 um, I did a week's work experience uh, in Normandy and that kind of gave me the bug to travel right. more because I was completely on my own I could I could barely speak French and by the end of the week you know I could really I, my language and understanding had improved so much so right. yeah you kind of do you find that when you go to different countries you can almost sort of absorb the language by almost like osmosis just by listening to people you know putting yourself in situations and things like that when I was younger it was easy it was easier for me I mean I did a lot of traveling when I was younger I even had my grandparents used to live in Normandy funny enough Uh so I used to go there a lot and 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 I learned French as a child um with my mother being in Colombia in South America I went and stayed with her a couple of times and I learned a little bit of sort of South American sort of Latin Spanish um but more recently having been to countries like Thailand and Sri Lanka and very recently I've been to Myanmar um and no I I find it extremely difficult to pick up any language whatsoever um so maybe 
I don't know, my hard drive is a bit bit full at the moment. It's a bit crammed with gem knowledge. Um, so trying to learn a language at the same time hasn't really kind of been happening for me. Um, but and, and again, you know, I've been lucky because one of the trips when I spent, I've spent nearly two months doing the research in, in America for that book. So I didn't, there was no language barrier and exactly the same with Australia. So language was not a problem. But certainly for the, for the Thailand and Sri Lanka and India, uh, I don't know. I, I'm not sure if it's lack of desire or just it's so complicated and it sounds really, you know, complicated that the idea of even trying to learn any language to me just scares me really, <laughs> scares me silly. So, uh, yeah, so my French and my Spanish is very rusty now. I think it's one of those things that unless you actually do immerse yourself in it and you keep it up, it's not, you know, it, uh, it's not really one of those things that is possible to maintain to any level where you can... It just goes after a while and... Yeah, I'm yeah. afraid so. Mine has. I'm very, <laughs> Like I say, I'm very rusty in some of my languages. and. Um... So what would the, the process be to, um, to actually go digging for gemstones? Cause, I mean, people have seen kind of panning for gold maybe on, on documentaries or on TV, but I don't think I've ever seen anybody actually looking for a, a diamond in the rough, so to speak. So what would the process oh, be? Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Well, you've got lots of opportunities if you go to the USA. <clears throat> you've got lots of opportunities there to go panning for gold and digging for diamonds. Um, is, there a, uh, is there a best place in the world to do it? Best place in the world. I don't know about best place in the world, but certainly in the USA, one of the most famous places is called the Crater of Diamonds in Arkansas. And that's where there have been at least, over the years, there have been at least half a dozen big finds, probably more than that, eight, ten big finds. It's where the Uncle Sam okay. was was discovered. Um, and you can actually go to the Crater of Diamonds and you can, you can dig, dig for diamonds. They plough the field. Basically, it's a field on a volcanic, on a volcanic crater. And you can you can go and dig on that field uh, for your own diamonds, and do you actually have to have any sort of documentation or <coughs> license or anything? You can just literally go to the field. No, and you try pay and pay your pay your pay your entrance fee, which I think is something around twenty dollars. So it's like the equivalent of going to a casino. You can, and then you can basically <laughs> keep anything that you find. Wow. And they have gemologists on site who will actually, if you think you found a diamond, they'll be able to confirm it. Wow. So I actually went, when I was there last year, I went to the Crater of Diamonds in May. And it was very, very, very hot. And to be honest, I mean, the, and there were, there were people there who were digging. They had their parasols for shade. Um, and they were digging. Um, I lasted about an hour. I, and I actually just walked around because it is said that some of those big finds, all those big finds, including the Uncle Sam, were surface finds. Wow. Okay, so you can walk around. So that's what I did. I, I walked around for an hour and I scanned, scanned the field, but I didn't find anything. Uh, but I'm actually going to be going back this December. I'm going to go to the Crater of Diamonds. And in fact, it's going to be about 15 degrees when I'm there, which is actually mm, a bit chilly, but it's a pleasant temperature for actually doing some serious digging. So that's what I will be doing. So that's the Crater of Diamonds wow. in Arkansas. Who knew? Yeah, absolutely. And there's a couple of other places in America you can actually dig. Uh, there's a place sort of in between Boston and New York. Now that's a different kind of diamond, and they're called Herkimer Diamonds. And you can actually, <coughs> excuse me, and Herkimer Diamonds are actually quartz. But they're, but they're very sparkly, and they're very unusual. They are very unique, and the unique thing about them is that they're actually, um, they have two, oh, what's the word, uh, two terminations at each end. So they're doubly terminated, and they've got something like 18 faces. So, and you can see, here's some examples. They're very, very small. They are very small. All those are Herkimer diamonds. Here's a bigger Herkimer diamond that I actually found, and I had wire wrapped. So that's quite a large find. Wow. <coughs> Here's some as well. Here are some more Herkimer diamonds, and you can see that they're a bit yellow. So they've got a bit of iron 
iron in them. They're a bit dirty, a bit yellow, but that's those are sort of your typical finds for Herkimer diamonds. And that would be in the, the New York area? Yes, New that's between, between New York and between Boston. In fact, there are four mines in that area. Um, it's called, I think it's Herkimer County. Uh, but, as I say, there's only one, there's one particular mine, which is called the Herkimer Diamond Mine. That's the original mine. And then there are three other mines, sort of within a half an hour drive, within this, you know, in the same county, where you can actually go and dig for Herkimer Diamonds. So you say the rules are sort of different for diamonds across the world. Does that apply to digging as well? Yes, absolutely. Um, I mean, these these places that I'm mentioning are tourist places where you can actually go and dig. But there are other diamond mines around the world where which would be where you can't dig. They're not tourist spots. You know, they might actually be genuine diamond mines. Some are still operational, some are not. And they will be very heavily guarded um, by military. And uh, they're not really not places where you should venture as a tourist. Why so would, why would that be? Just because they they're looking to so is it a more fertile site for diamonds, or is it just so that it's just completely off limits? Because it'll be off limits because, as I say, if if it's a if it's an operational diamond mine, um, there's a lot of money. Uh, you know, they don't want people thieving. Oh, I they see. don't want trespasses. So it will be heavily guarded and heavily protected, um, and there will be penalties if you are caught trespassing. What would the penalty be, just out of interest? Um, depends on the country. Uh, it depends on the mine, and it depends on the um, the rules. But I mean, some countries are, are some mines in some countries are protected by military. And if you're caught trespassing, it, I'm not going to say you'll get shot, but you know they do the military. They cover. They carry. Um, they carry guns. And that's not just for decoration. It's not just for decoration. No. Wow. That's so you really, really do have to be very, very careful. You know, if as I say, the mines that the places that I mention in the books are tourist spots, and you'll be perfectly so safe. But if you venture off those off the beaten track then you need to know you need to know the rules and and the penalties yeah basically definitely have you seen a documentary it's on youtube and it's a crime documentary and seeing as we're in london it was um a bid to take the de beers millennium star diamond from the millennium dome by a gang of thieves from london and kent have you seen that at all I've heard about it. Yeah. I don't think I watched the video. I can't remember exactly what the value of the diamond was, but the rumor was that it was they're working for a Russian gang. Is that a big business? Would you say, like in the underworld, sort of diamonds and things like that, or do you think it's quite sort of mainstream? Um, there is definitely a huge underworld in the gem trade, and it's called the black market. Yeah. Um and. Yeah, it's huge. And you know, but at the end of the day I would I would say I mean and the reason why the why, the, why there is a black market in some countries is purely because you know the gem trade is heavily heavily um heavily what what's the word I'm trying to think of um protected and legislated by the government. So it's very difficult for people to actually trade if, if, you know, they've made it so complicated in some countries for people to actually trade legally that they turn to trading illegally. Really? Yes. Ah. So that's why there's a, that's why there's a black market and that's why, you know, there is a lot of um, illegal trading going on in the gem, in the gem trade. And that's why you have to be careful. But, you know, for some people it's, it's not... For some people, it's just a case that they're trying to earn a living. Yeah. You know, people out there have got families to feed. So, and I'm not saying that it's okay to trade illegally. Um, you you know, and there, are different, and there are different levels in the black market. There, I'm sure there's different levels yeah. of, uh, um, you know, how deep, how deep you go in the black market. But, I mean, certainly, 
um, just for, you know, on the surface, um, for some of the small miners that trade illegally, it's possibly because it's actually been made so complicated for them to actually trade legally. You know, so, but as I say, everyone's trying to earn a living. But this is why, this is why there are, you know, this is why tricks, people, you know, this is why, like I say, they're trying to earn a living and this is why, you know, tricks and scams do happen. So, uh, and that's really, you know, the, I, the purpose behind the books are to protect people from those, to give people a little knowledge so that they know what they're up against, you know, they know the pitfalls. Yeah. Um, but, you know, buying a, a souvenir on holiday, a, a gemstone, a piece of jewellery, it should be something of joy. And I want people to have joy and the excitement and to, to experience the romance of, pay, you know, of buying a souvenir on holiday. So, um, but, you know, as I say, there are, you need to... At least I would like people to do a little bit of homework if they if they are planning. I mean, it might be a <coughs> completely spur of the moment, uh, impulsive buy, and that's absolutely fine. That's fine, but you know, just remember to ask lots of questions. Um, and and if you if if your gut is trying to tell you something's not right, then then listen to your gut, really. So I really hope that you enjoyed that fascinating insight into the world of gemstones. Uh, just remember, if you're listening via YouTube, you can subscribe to my channel. Just hit the red subscribe button. I'd also appreciate it if you could like and share the uh, podcast as well. Equally so, on iTunes, you can hit subscribe, and I will see you on the next podcast.